Hello, everybody. Welcome to yet another edition of Anthony Peak Consciousness Now in Con. Today is, um, I think, the third opportunity I've had the chance to have long conversations and discussions with somebody I have admired for so long. Uh, and I, I very rarely use this phrase, but the great Graham Nichols. And I say great because of one thing that he sorted me out on. When I wrote my first book, uh, when I wrote my book, um, The Out of Body Experience, Graham was very, very complimentary, but pointed out to me that I was being a little bit severe by saying that um, out of body experiences tended to be intrasomatic. That is the idea that they are inwardly and you go inside and you create a world based upon your expectations and then you project your consciousness out into that world and Graham pointed out to me that there are many cases where that may be the case but from his own experiences that was not the case and that he had a series of experiences in his life and many experiences whereby he had been outside of his body in what we call consensual reality and Graham gave me quite a degree of evidence about this, which totally convinced me and changed my opinion about the phenomenon. And I now conclude that it is a mixture of both. And indeed, Graham's experiences are extraordinary. And if you have not already had the opportunity to read his books and check out his workshops, they are well worth doing. Because out there in the world of OBE training, there are an awful lot of people I consider to be charlatans for want of a better term. Graham is the real deal. Graham does the science. Gray, Graham is similar to me in the sense that he's intrigued as to what is really going on here. So he's very much our side of the fence on these things. And I'm really looking forward to now a completely unstructured two hour discussion on the out of body experience, what it means, what it is, what it, what it can tell us about being human. And of course, what's really brilliant about this is that we have Sarah involved as well, Sarah James, who also is somebody who has regularly throughout her life had out of the body experiences and lucid dreaming and everything else as well. So it's gonna be a fascinating discussion. By all means, give us your feedback. If you want to have questions and want any, any, any clarifications, please post on the Facebook page and let us know and we will try if we can to answer your questions as well. So Graham, without further ado, welcome to Incom. Hi Anthony, good to be here. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Now, one of the things that I always, whenever I do an interview with you, it's, it's always, I want to know a little bit about your experiences and background. So could you, just for a background, I know we've, done, we've already discussed this on two previous interviews, but you, could you tell us a little bit about how the OBE state became part of your life and, and, and your experiences when you were a young guy? Um, well, I guess to really answer that, you've got to go even sort of before the out of body experiences, because it probably the part, the time that I really consider that it all started was um, an apparition experience when I was about five. So that apparition experience, I don't know what really to call it. It wasn't a conventional ghost type experience. Um, it was a, a form humanoid form that appeared in the doorway of the flat that I grew up in. I grew up in a tower block. Um, and basically I came out of my bedroom, went into the hallway and saw this tall apparition filling the, the doorway, basically. Um, and I fell down onto ground level. I was kind of terrified of it. I didn't know how to sort of react to it. Um, so I, I went down onto the sort of ground level, I think, thinking about it, it was like, I think the solidity of the floor kind of gave me some sense of uh, protection or something like that in my childish kind of uh, mind. And I remember trying to call out to my parents who were sort of behind. So I turned away from it, tried to call out, but I couldn't make any sound. And then I turned around and it was still there. Um, in retrospect, I look at that and Possibly it could have been something related to sleep paralysis. There are a few characteristics related to sleep paralysis, although I wasn't paralyzed. Um, but anyway, I, I saw this figure and it and it felt like a kind of a shift in my whole perception of things after that. I guess my whole childhood, I was very fascinated by things like was the figure, did the figure seem independent of you? Did it did it did it definitely seem, yeah. Right. Has it ever appeared since? Or was it just that one time? No, 
no it's not appeared since and not definitely unless it's it's been in some other kind of form but not in the form that it originally appeared in that first experience as as best i can remember um mm. it looked quite shamanic thinking back really i mean mm. it it sort of almost was like it was wearing some kind of costume or robes or something of that nature but not so, in a... so it wasn't just a, a shape it, it was something you know it was it was it was it was a physical presence that you could identify it had a face and clothing and everything else as well yeah yeah wow. it seemed to be wearing a kind of mask wow um so that's why i kind of associate it somewhat with shamanic cultures and that kind of thing because but that's all in you know looking back at it mm. i don't know mm. i don't know whether that's me kind of adding things on years later because my memory from a five-year-old is pretty vague so um but essentially that sort of opened me up to being interested in those kinds of things and maybe being more aligned towards those kind of things and then when I was 12 um that's when I had my first spontaneous out of all the experiences which were also quite unusual um, because they weren't the classic coming out of the body, looking down at yourself and that kind of thing. Um, they were experiences where I almost instantaneously found myself um, near the near the school that I went to at the time, the primary school. Um, well, actually, I wouldn't have been going there by then. I would have left. So it would have, I would have left a year earlier. So but it was back to the primary school that I'd been at. Were, were you asleep? Before. Were you asleep at the time? No. Or was, right. So no, my was... OBEs have never, you know, never been to do with sleep. Mm. They've never, I mean, I can probably count on one hand the amount of times they've been really associated with sleep. So the first time it happened, where were you when it happened? And, and how did it affect how did it affect you? How did the process take place? I was in my bedroom. I was just relaxing. Um again, I'm not totally sure but I remember it roughly as it was after school and it was maybe an hour or two after school um that's how I remember it and uh, I was just relaxing on my bed and just it was almost like a shift in my awareness just like bang and my whole awareness kind of seemed to just black out and then I found myself in this location which I worked out using maps was about 500 meters from in distance from where I was physically. Um, and I was above the ground by about, about a foot, foot and a half, something like that off the ground in a vertical position. So not horizontal, like the classic sort of descriptions of OBEs. Um, so it was literally like I was standing in midair and this happened, I think, two or three times. My memory is vague on, on it, but it happened spontaneously two or three times during that during that year. Um, and then it seemed to just not happen again. And then that was when I started looking into ways to make it happen and to learn to induce it. So it, because I, I learned that it was an actual thing, I heard about the phenomena. I really don't remember where I heard about it, but I heard about it somewhere and then went out on a bit of a mission to learn about it, basically. Which routes, did, which were the areas that you initially pursued in terms of your research into the phenomenon? Well, the first book I read was uh, Out of Body Experiences, a handbook by Janet Lee Mitchell, which is a scientifically focused book. Um, so that's sort of, she did experiments with signs and, shapes and stuff on platforms and people would try to perceive them while out of body that kind that kind of experiment and she got some good results and mm -hmm. some not so good it was a mixed bag but she definitely got enough results to convince her that there was something to it um and so that was really interesting to me and that sparked my interest in parapsychology then I basically read everything I could on the subject. So from sort of the occult literature through to um, specific books on astral projection, you know, the classic ones, projection of the astral body, um, practical astral projection by Ram, um, how do you pronounce it? Um, all these 
different that was probably one of my favorites um so yeah i i read a whole range off the l which had an influence on a lot of people like william bielman as well the art of astral projection i think that one's called um jh brennan's work astral doorways i was really fascinated by the idea of doorways and using um symbols and images in order to do OBEs or astral projection in that way. So I, I worked with the Tattva symbols, which are the, uh, they originate in Hinduism. Um, they symbolize the different elements, but then they were brought into sort of Western OBE astral projection, uh, com the community via the Golden Dawn, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Um, so they sort of introduced that as a way of working. They used to call it traveling in the spirit vision. Um, so it was, they didn't consider it purely astral projection in the, in the sort of classic sense. It was more a way of, I guess, a, a kind of advanced form of clairvoyance, I guess they would, mm. have, they would have considered it. So I did, I did all the sort of training with that, um, was a member of a golden dawn group. So I did a lot of training with them. Um, so yeah, I, I basically, I was also, you know, covens i was involved in uh witchcraft and i just explored all of the different areas that you could on the subject really so were there was... any particular areas that resonated with you and you thought no this seems to be the correct path you mentioned one of the books that you thought was very good but were there were there areas that you thought no this is this is mirroring my experiences to be honest no not really <laughs> interesting um I, I think that most of the literature I read was heavily laced with assumptions and kind of uh, metaphysical and esoteric understandings that, that well, you could, you could make them fit. They, you know, they seem to make, like things like the astral plane kind of, it, it seems to make sense. It kind of does resonate to some degree with what we experience, but I think when you really start to question it, does it always operate in the ways that are being described? And, you know, are there, like, like you do with your own research, are there areas that sort of contradict this way of viewing things? And I, and I guess that's, that's what started to change my mind on the whole thing. Because then um, at around 15 or 16, I was working with Douglas Baker, who was a, an esoteric teacher um, in London, doing a lot of lectures. He wrote more than a hundred books. I don't even know how many he wrote, but one of them was about astral projection. I think it was called Techniques of Astral Projection. I'm not sure, um, but that um, I, I was working regularly with him and he would kind of give me different pointers and suggestions and whatever, but a lot of his ideas, which he'd drawn from Theosophy and Alice Bailey and people like that, again, didn't seem to, add up especially as I was under 18 and he believed that you had to mature in terms of you know your age uh before you could do certain things or experience certain things in an OBE um and that didn't conform with what I was experiencing I for one of the examples was he would talk about that uh, before you're 18 you see in black and white in an out-of-body experience and going right back to my experiences as a 12 year old they were they were in color all the way through so so yeah so so it was kind of I think that made me start to question and then I would have experiences that I maybe at the time believed were on the astral planes um, but they seemed to be quite illusory they seemed to be more like um fantasies or dreams or whatever um so then i became interested okay there are some experiences which i had at that time that were consistent with consensus reality that were consistent with the the reality that we experience on a day-to-day -day level and then there were others that seemed to be mixed and then there were others that seemed to not conform so then i started to consider are there ways to kind of separate the wheat from the chaff if you like and try to try to refine it down to the experiences that seem to have some objective uh, validity to them. That's not to say they were always on this level. My, what I call shared death experience was not on physical reality, but it conformed with uh, a plane crash that happened 
in physical reality. So can you, can you explain that a little bit more? Um, well, what happened with that experience was I had I came out of body. It happened in the in the morning. I had this out of body experience um, quite spontaneous or well, semi spontaneously. A lot of my experiences are kind of a mixture of the two, because what will happen is I'll feel like I'm in a conducive state for the out of body experience to happen, maybe even pre or early vibrational state. I feel like a heightened energy. And if I get that feeling, I sometimes choose to go with it and to encourage it. And that will often lead into an outbody experience. So you get the vibrational state. So in just understanding the process for the people that are listening in here, it will start, you will sense there's something changing in your environment. And you... Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> Live recordings. <laughs> Absolutely. It's always the case, isn't it? So can you just explain for people who, because I know the vibrational state is something people talk about, and then we'll, we'll move on to the, the shared death it, experience. It was, I would say it was like a pre-vibrational state. It was kind of like a heightening of energy. That, that's often what I get. It's sort of, um, I put a lot of emphasis even in my teaching on the, the pre-state, the, if you like, having the, a good foundational basis for the out-body experience to happen. Because if you get that right, then the actual technique becomes almost irrelevant. It becomes much easier because then you just need something simple to trigger the experience once you have all of the foundational factors in place. So anyway, in this particular experience, um, I felt con like it was conducive and I kind of went with it is how I remember it. Again, I'd have to check my diaries to be completely certain of that. But I came out of body and I, instead of finding myself in the room or in a physical environment, I found myself in a cloud-like environment. It was quite stereotypical, I guess, of the sort of afterlife you might see in a film or something like that. Um, it was sort of bellowing cloud. There was no sense of up or down. Um, there didn't seem to be any surface. Um, it was just this vast expanse of cloud um, or mist and cloud. Um, and at a distance, which I would guess it was about 200 meters away, um, there was a gathering or a group of um, what I estimated in my diaries was 150 people, roughly. Um, and they all seemed confused and kind of st not stressed. Some of them were, but that wasn't really to do with the circumstance. Some of them were having essentially a life review, what you would what you would hear described in near-death experiences. So they were literally going through. Like How did you know they were? Could I you could see, see what you could see I what they could see? Yeah, I was literally, it was almost like a screen or a thought bubble or something like that. I could almost like, not everyone, I was, it was sort of, it seemed to be the people that I focused in on. Um, and when I focused in on them, then I could uh, get this sense of their thoughts and perceptions and, I have a vivid memory of one man in particular who um, I think was thinking about his father. He, he had this image of a very leathery faced kind of man who looked like he'd worked outside his whole life. Um, and he was in conflict with this. He was stressed by this memory. So I interpret, I, I don't know really if this was the case, but I interpreted it as being um, he's, had some kind of conflict in his life between him and his father. And that's now causing him an emotional issue in this afterlife type state. Um, I did have a sense that this was a kind of afterlife environment, but I didn't know why. Um, it was just a sort of knowing that was present in the experience. And then I remember at the far side of the group, there was a, I think a woman um, and she passed into the sort of mist and cloud uh, much easier. She seemed to go through the process of this kind of life review much easier. So she, she sort of disappeared into the cloud. Um, and so essentially they were all kind of going through different degrees of this sort of emotional transition. Um, and I watched this for a time. I felt like I couldn't get any closer, felt like there was a sort of distance. And if I got any closer, I don't know what would have happened, but it was almost like I shouldn't go any closer. And then I came out of the experience 
And then as I remember it, I think uh, I think it was the same day, um, there was a news report about a plane crash on the island of Svalbard, in, which is an island owned by Norway. Um, it's where the seed bank is. It's uh, kind of well known for that. Um, and they said that 100 and I think it was 141 people were killed in the crash. And there was also um, that the description of the people, I think most of them were Russian or U Ukrainian. Um, and that sort of conformed with what I perceived in the experience. So that experience happened on a different level, but it seemed to conform with reality on this level as well. That's very interesting because I don't know if you know from my writings, I don't know if I've ever actually written about this, but I will be in, involving it in, and mentioning it in my new book. And indeed, as I'll be mentioning one or two of your experiences that we, we've we previously discussed. Um, but one of the guys, somebody contacted me many years ago who was a university lecturer at the University of Liverpool uh, uh, in law. So, you know, a very structured minded guy. And he'd had a whole series of experiences of precognitions, but his precognitions were very um, almost like out of the body experiences where he'd find himself in another location viewing a particular set of circumstances. And he described to me how he found himself out of his body and he was in what seemed like a hotel room in, and he knew it was France and he knew what time of year it was. It was late spring or something. You could tell from the, the trees and things. And he said in the in the sequence, he, he moved towards the window to see Concord fly past with its back on fire. And he watched it as Concord crashed. And then, and this is what makes it very intriguing, very similar to yours. And this is quite unusual that it seemed to me at the time. He said he then felt people go through him. And because he's a German speaker, he's English, but he speaks fluent German. He could hear people talking to each other saying, my God, where am I? What's happened? And he said he could feel the sense of their fear and everything else as well. And the fact that they'd recently died. And he was so concerned about this. He sent to British Airways um, a, 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 tele a, a fax stating that somewhere, and he thinks it was going to be France, that Concorde was going to crash. Now, I think at that stage there were maybe three Concords, possibly four. And it was the safest aircraft in the world. And of course, a few years, quite comparatively soon afterwards, Concorde crashed in Paris at Orly. And what he was particularly intrigued by was that many of the people that died on the crash, the plane had been chartered by a German tour firm. So the people on the plane were German. Now, to me, this was incredible evidence of both an out of the body experience and a precognition of something that profoundly changed his life because he found it very difficult to deal with. As you can imagine, you know, he felt very guilty that he'd failed to get the message through to British Airways or to Air France to say, look, please. And of course he appreciated and he said, well, of course, you know, they must get these kind of cookie letters all the time from people saying, you know, we think there's going to be a plane crash. But even applying the law of large numbers to this, it, it, it still is, you know, it is extraordinary, the accuracy of his experience. And of course, this then reminds me, and it probably is the right moment now to mention your incredible experience in terms of Soho, um, which we'll talk about now, I think, because it, it segues in quite well to that. And then we'll move back to the development. But can we, can we just mention that now so we don't lose that? Because guys, if you've not heard this before, this, this is extraordinary and i mean i mean really probably of all the experiences i've heard this is the most extraordinary and the most powerful and the most proof you can ever imagine of pre precognitive out of body experiences so graham if you can explain it okay well um it started we were having a, a meeting um there was uh, a few friends basically who I was teaching the G technique which I'd just developed this is in 1999 um, so we we hired a room and we were going through this process I was teaching them the methodology and 
actually as I was doing it I wasn't really getting any particular kind of result I felt like something wasn't right like it wasn't working or something like that and I remember kind of um wondering if I'd kind of uh worked out the technique wrong or something like that and almost as I'm thinking this it sort of almost hit me um like I went into this altered state there was like this shift in my consciousness and I I went down onto the ground but the only reason for that really is because I would have fallen over if I didn't um so I basically laid on the ground and almost as soon as I became still and I was on the ground I went into an out-of-body experience and initially found myself in a natural environment um it was like being in a sort of jungle type environment there was trees there was uh, a stream I think there was it, it was just like being in a sort of tropical environment so this is how the experience started I don't know why it started like this but it did um and so I was moving through this um tropical environment and then there was a point when it was almost like the the visual or the or the environment I was in seemed to break away it seemed to be like a, a shift and I went from being in that tropical type environment to standing on the corner of Moore Street and Old Compton Street in Soho in London so now if people are familiar with that area or if they've ever been there there's a it kind of points there's almost like you've got the you've got old compton street on the right and then this diagonal smaller street more street coming in from the left and it creates a kind of sliver a kind of pointed area of of pavement um and i was standing right on this point so it was almost like i was sort of on a point looking straight down the street um i knew exactly where i was because i'd worked in that area in the past I remember looking across to my right and there was the Polo Bar, um, which was an Italian restaurant that I used to go to. Um, so I so I could identify exactly where I was. So then I could see about 150 meters. See, this seems to be a sort of consistency in the experiences as well. Like often there's this distance, um, which was also apparent in the shared deaf experience I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. There was, there was this distance that seems to be consistent in a lot of the experiences where I'm at a distance to what's going on by 150 or so meters. There's, there's this kind of um, rough distance. Um, so I'm looking down the street and I can see the sort of bars and whatever of Soho. And on the right hand side, in one of the bars, there's this explosion bursts out. Um, then almost as soon as the explosion bursts out, I sent someone close to me on, on the right hand side. And there's a man runs close by me um, towards the explosion. Um, whereas there's sort of chaos ensuing more near the explosion and people are going in different directions and things like that. But this man, I don't know whether he was trying to help or what he was doing, but he kind of ran towards the explosion. And then I sort of lost focus on what he was doing um and then in a kind of slow rhythm coming out from the explosion i felt this emotional wave hit me in the chest which i guess relates a bit to what you were saying about mm. um the concord experience where he was describing experiencing the emotion so in this experience i also had a precognition of the 7-7 bombing it just wasn't witnessed in the way the soho one was but um in all of the experiences like that that I've had and the shared deaf experience, there was this sense of experiencing or sharing in the emotion of the people who were involved. So in the Soho experience, this energy hit me in the chest and that's kind of what brought me out of the experience. So it, I came out of the out-of-body experience. I was no longer in Soho and then I was in a kind of void state, just this sort of blackness so I was conscious and I was aware, but there was no sensory information. I was just in this kind of void. And then gradually, one of the people who was there, uh, Chris, um, Chris Neto, he started to sort of coax me out of it. And then I was also aware of uh, one of the other people there, Lawrence Brightman. And he was also, I think they'd become 
aware that there was something wrong and they were aware that I was struggling with something. So they kind of had come over to sort of help me out or see if I was okay. Um, and I slowly came out of the... So from their point of view, they'd seen you, what, lose consciousness and were lying on the floor? Or from their point of view, what did they see of you, if that makes sense? Um, I think that they saw everyone was sort of doing the technique in their own way. So everyone oh, sort of separated out to oh. practice the technique. So it wasn't unusual that I was sort of laying down. Oh, okay. Sort okay. of going through this because they were doing the same process. Oh, okay. But they noticed, I think that, I don't know at what point um, I'd have to ask, but at some point there was kind of more of a struggle or, you know something was was going on with me and they they'd perceived that um so um i remember sort of lawrence especially was kind of uh maybe aware that something was going on with me um and so yeah so basically they just sort of coaxed me out and then when i came back to normal awareness which i don't really remember how long that took but just a few minutes i think when I came back to normal awareness, I just described that I'd seen this uh, precognitive, what I believe was precognitive experience of this bombing in Soho and described the sort of details of it. So we sort of all sat in a circle kind of to talk about our experiences because we would always do that when we had these meetings. We would always, after we tried a technique or whatever, we would gather in a circle and we would say, oh, this happened for me or whatever. So that was quite a normal thing to do. So we, we sort of gathered and I described what I'd seen, so. And the, th the fascinating thing about this, isn't it? You know, that you, you actually had witnesses and the witnesses have signed forms to say they were there. So the only, what possible explanation can be made for your experience the only the only avenue that the skeptic can go down in terms of this particular experience is to say coincidence isn't it that's all they can say because was it a week later or, or i think it was five days five days and then an explosion takes place at the admiral duncan admiral admiral duncan pub in exactly the location you described now to me what more proof can anybody demand if it was a court of law and you were a witness of something in a court of law, that would be irrefutable. And yet people are still in denial that these things happen, you know, and as, as uh, was it William James said, you know, the thing is, you know, all you need is one black swan to, di to disprove the whole model of, of what reality really is. Now, you definitely saw this. And it's not as if you didn't see it as it, you know, it was just some, a flash in the pan because it had been happening to you before. Um, so to me, you know, I would say to the listeners out there and the people watching this, you know, think very hard about Graham's experience here and try to come to conclusions in your own mind as to what this is telling you about the true nature of reality and what reality really is, because if the future is out there and hasn't happened yet, how could Graham possibly see these set of circumstances? I mean, I know, Graham, that you're a, a highly rational, logical individual. Do you, did you try to convince yourself of, of, of other ex possible explanations for that? Sure. I was, I, I, I mean, going back to that whole kind of warning people type scenario and all of that, I was, I, I guess I, I went through the whole situation of, well, you know, um, is this real? I didn't really believe in precognition, to be honest. Um, I was quite sceptical of that possibility. I still find it hard to get my head around it, to be honest. Um, but it's happened to me multiple times, and I've even done scientific research with precognition, where, um, like with Rupert Sheldrake's um, work, for example, and I, I got, he told me I got the highest score in a single test so that's within a controlled computerized scientific test so you know when you put all of that together it's very it would be irrational for me mm. to kind of dismiss all of that i think really um 
but yeah I really did struggle with it um and I I didn't know what to do in terms of I did sort of want to warn people but then at the same time when it when the experience happened what I the piece of information I was missing was the time scale I didn't know when exactly it was going to happen as it turned out it was only five days but I didn't know that at the time mm. so you're in a situation where this could be years this could be you know you, you have no idea I mean I that was the first precognitive experience I'd ever had so I had no sense of how to maybe try and work out the time scale and I still don't think there are many ways to do that I know within remote viewing research for example they try when people do have what seem to be precognitive perceptions they'll try to identify a time frame by world events or by some kind of symbol that okay when this happens this is then going to happen as well so it's a kind of you know connected events approach but that's as best anyone sort of come up with in terms of how to identify the time frame I guess so that's really the problem that you come into and, and that's what happened with the 777 bombing for me as well um can you tell us I, about that well with that one um there was a much bigger time frame not it, it was sort of months uh prior so and that was almost more concerning to me because at the time I was living in London, I was, my father was working on London Underground. Um, so I had like a direct family and emotional link to that. And actually my dad was working at Edgware Road at the time, which was one of the locations that was bombed. Interestingly, that wasn't the location I saw in my OBE though. I saw the one that was in uh, Orgate East, um, so and the experience started in Moorgate so I had an, this experience where I literally went through the the tarmac through the um through the road down into the tunnel um so I didn't follow the route of the you know of the entrance or anything like that I just went straight into the through the ground and found myself um floating in the middle of the train platform um and could see the Moorgate sign in front of me so I was basically as if I was standing on the train but I wasn't on the train and then I followed the actual train um out into Liverpool Street Station so I was kind of following it through the tunnel from Moorgate and then when it stopped in Liverpool Street I stopped behind it in in the OBE and then the train pulled away but I didn't follow it then um, so it pulled away and pulled into the tunnel. And I believe that the explosion happened between Orgate East and Liverpool Street Station. So um, I remained sort of at the far end of Liverpool Street. So again, there's sort of this distance of, I don't know what the exact distance would be, but I don't think it would be that far in terms of meter meters, the length of the platform, plus the distance the train had gone into the tunnel um and again I had this sort of emotional wave that kind of hit me so they're the oh and the thing I've left out that we should mention as well is both of these experiences had this blue gray quality mm, the, the cerulean effect that you've mentioned yeah, the cerulean effect that's happened only in three of my experiences um but each one of them had veridical elements one of them was not precognitive precognitive and two of them were so that's because this brings always some amazing moral questions, doesn't it? You know, the first thing is, why me? Why am I being given what seems to be a spontaneous experience that isn't driven by you, is not created by you, where you suddenly see something that's going to happen in the future that people are going to be killed in or, or and people are going to die and get injured? And then there's this great responsibility of thinking, well, I know, like, like my associate said, you know, I now know something is going to happen and I desperately would like to change it. But again, just to explain a little bit here that I was also approached many years ago by a young guy who was a PhD student in literally in rocket science. And he has, and still has, um, 
a, 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 a tumor, a benign tumor on his pineal gland. And he has extremely powerful deja vu sensations. And the deja vu sensations always involve the fact that he knows what's going to be happening in the next minute or two. It's a very short term process. It might even be seconds. But I remember talking to him one day and saying, well, why don't you speak to somebody to say, when you have this precognitive experience and you've got somebody with you, why don't you turn around and say, I now know what you're going to say to me, or I now know what's going to happen next. And he said something to me, which was profoundly perceptive and something I hadn't realized before. He said, because if I did, the incident wouldn't happen. Because of course it's true, isn't it? If I suddenly have a precognition now and I turn around and I say, Graham, I know what you're going to say. Suddenly you're not going to say what you said. You're going to turn around and say, well, what is that then? And, you know, this is almost elements of many worlds interpretation, many minds interpretation, the, the sum over histories the, uh, of, um, you know, the quantum physics, the idea that there are alternate realities, all of which will collapse a particular wave function to accommodate that particular decision you make. But, and he's quite right, but here we have a kind of a moral imperative. But of course, if you'd announced, say you'd have gone to, I don't know, um, into the pub that day or a few days before and said, there's gonna be a bombing in here, be careful about it. It might not have then happened. And of course, then your prediction would not have taken place and people would have said, well, it was nonsense because it didn't happen as Graham described it. So there are all these kind of really peculiar issues that come out of this. And again, something that I've spoken of many times in my writings that is very much contradicted by your experience, because I've very much taken the viewpoint of the J.W. Dunn idea of the way in which we precognize sets of circumstances where we hear major issues of news through the media or through newspapers and everything else. And that's our recognition. And that's what we're perceiving. But with you, you were seeing 7-7 seven, seven from a very different viewpoint, weren't you? You know, you were seeing it from behind the train as if you were in a disembodied state. You weren't seeing it through the eyes of any of the other people involved. And then we have this kind of weird cerulean effect. And we've discussed this many times, I know, and it's something that very much intrigues me. It seems as if the kind of the electromagnetic spectrum is shifting in some way while the perception is taking place. Have you any thoughts on what that may be happening there? Or what? Well, I've, I've given that quite a lot of thought, the whole, what the Cerulean effect was. And it, it led me to start to think about the visual structures that are experienced within an out body experience. I realized that so the phenomenology of our body experiences hasn't really been described in, in much detail. Um, there's generally in the near-death experience literature and the outer body experience literature, it generally just talks about vision as if it's exactly the same. And to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense because we know that in an outer body experience, we're not using our eyes and our usual sensory apparatus. So there's got to be, there's got to be something else going on. Um, but we could be using uh, the sort of the visual cortex, or we could be using some aspect of the visual system that we would usually use, but just not via the eyes. So um, the same way we can close our eyes and, and we can have effects that are caused by our visual system, but not literally because of what we're seeing in the world. Um, so I started to think, well, if you're having information coming into the brain, let's say, um, psychic information in some other form, um, would the brain then possibly try to interpret that information and turn it into something usable um, in some structure that we, that would, you know, that it would usually do, so like visuals. Um, but then if it did that, would we sometimes have maybe an incomplete picture or a fragmentary picture or something like that? Um, so this was my sort of line of thinking. So then I was like, okay, so let's research. Is there any area where cerulean or blue gray type vision is described? And I discovered that there is um, scotopic vision 
Um, mm. So scotopic vision basically means low light vision. So it arises in situations where you've been in low light for a certain period of time and your, your eyes switch between the cones and the rods. I forget which way around it is, but um, you, basically the eyes switch into this night vision function, essentially. So you start to see in a diminished color range. Um, so this was really interesting to me because I started to think, well, if we're in this experience, we're in a darkened space, we're having an out of body experience, we're experiencing the world in a sort of darkened environment. And those factors of the visual system or, um, are active, then maybe it would make sense that our perception or our um, psychic perception in that context would, would come to the fore in, in that scotopic way, in that low light context. So then I started to think about, okay, so um, are there any other characteristics of our body vision that, that I can identify? And I, I identified a set of them. Um, so there are other veridical frameworks as well. So for example, um, the sort of red yellow area of the spectrum uh, the visible light spectrum, I sort of worked out that they seem to correlate with the visible light spectrum in pairs. So I think what we're dealing with is duotone um, vision. So what seems to happen is you see in only two of the colors of the visible light spectrum. So there's the blue gray or the red yellow, or, you know, um, the sort of deep magenta at the far end which is also characteristic of early out of body experiences, for example, mm. when someone's not very advanced and maybe they can't see very much in their early experiences, it's often in this sort of magenta sort of color um, or, you know, almost to black. So yeah, I identified all these different uh, visual forms that it seems to take. So that led me to think, well, maybe, we're dealing with reduced forms of uh, visual perception. So it's something to do with how the brain is translating the psychic experience in some way. So that's kind of where I started heading. That is absolutely fascinating. That really is. Sarah, um, I know that you'll be madly making notes there in the background. Uh, I'd like <laughs> to draw you in here and... Uh, your thoughts, feelings, and any comments that are being made so far? I noticed there's quite a few questions already coming through. Yes, so much of what you're saying, Graham, is very similar to my experiences of especially um, starting young. And also you seem to have pursued very similar lines of inquiry as well. And what you were just saying about um, the experience of light, I think about all the time with regard to lucid dreaming, because I have the same experience of this particular quality of light that is very different. And when you're lucid, you're able to um, properly analyze it and think about it in a, in a fully conscious way, I suppose. Um, and I have read, there is a, a theory about dreaming um, that exactly like you say, the visual processing parts of the brain interpret sensory information using that mode of, uh, that mode of processing that it's used to during the day. And I think that that's a really, really good point that you make. But you also reminded me of when I was a kid, I um, had a lot of false awakenings, which I've started to think of recently as being potentially projection events, because I would do the same thing over and over again. Of I thought I was out of my bed getting dressed. Um, and I did seem to occupy this different space, uh, like a kind of between the worlds sort of space. And it was very interesting to me what you were saying about seeing apparitions appear in the doorway because that's where I always saw things as well and I remember seeing a wolf's face once in the doorway uh, and uh, things often when they would appear would appear in in the doorway and I wonder whether that's to do with this threshold this idea of the threshold of where you're able to see and how far you can go and that you don't know what's the, on the other side of the door so the entities or the, the visualizations seem to occur there. And I was reading some interesting stuff recently about um, ancient perceptions of doorways as being liminal spaces or threshold spaces where you had to keep your 
domestic setting pure and ordered because the outside world represented chaos and I think that you kind of get that sense of the unknown or beyond the threshold there's potentially chaos out there but just absolutely like completely mesmerized and interested in everything you're saying it's really 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 good and we me and Anthony were talking before you came online about how with some people that are ingenuine making these kinds of claims you get this sense and you don't quite know why but it just makes you feel uneasy and then everything you've said today really made me feel completely there seems to be like a lot of veracity and uh um honesty in, in the stories that you're telling and I think the fact that you tried to explain it scientifically and you started off reading neuroscience books that's what I I had that same experience as well of trying to read about what was happening in the brain and uh one of the things that the conclusions that I've come to is that often those very analytical brain orientated people don't have very exciting dreams because if they did they would write about dreams or out-of-body experiences because they're the most extraordinary phenomenon that human beings experience really yeah yeah i, <laughs> yeah, I totally agree there right? on the on the threshold thing i actually called the chapter in my first book um i called it the threshold because um that that experience with the entity when I was five it also had this sense of a sort of a space or an expanse behind it so I definitely saw it as something along those lines and, and yeah going back to what you're saying about um you know an association in sort of folklore and things like that with with these boundaries and things like that where you've got like you know in you find them all over the, the country these sort of uh, carved rings that yeah. you see on on doorways windows fireplaces that they used to, in, in turkey yeah. and places like that as well yeah they used to put the rings to sort of ward off witchcraft and things like that you know so there's all these kind of ideas and they used to put shoes and things in the walls of the houses and stuff mm. like that which were supposed to create protection from things coming in and that kind of stuff so, i yeah. think i think one of the most strangest most strangest one of the strangest things i've ever been shown was graham you're probably aware that sarah and i were both involved in an event at dracolo tunnels um two years ago uh, april two years ago and i had the opportunity to go and suss out the location beforehand with one of, uh, with a couple of the researchers that were involved in doing research in those caves and one of the guys, he showed me, he took me to a particular part of the, the tunnels. And again, it was a doorway. And he said, right, the doorway you're now looking at. And then he, he opened his phone and he said, this is a photograph that was taken from this location by a research group about six or seven months before. I'm, I don't know the timescales. I'm not sure about that. I won't quote it on that. But the, the photograph he showed me, and the only reason I've never been able to use this photograph in any of my work and any of my lectures or anything else is because it, it, it is proprietal. It belongs to a research group and they're not quite sure what to do with it. But it was quite extraordinary. It's in the doorway. There is standing. The only thing I can describe it is, is a star being. It's, it's a human shape. And, you know, it's a complete human shape standing in the doorway, but its body is black and inside the body are stars. And it's the only the only only explanation, I, the only description I can give. It's a star being. And and I said, surely this has been photoshopped. It's been played around with. And he said, no, no, genuinely. And I mean, this guy is a, is a, is a, is a PhD researcher. So, you know, he, he, he's seriously on the line with this. And again, you know, you do have this idea of the kind of the portal, the going through into somewhere else. And I think Sarah's point was an incredibly valid one there is, you know, it's it's a message, isn't it? It's a symbol of something that you can't go through. And of course, as you said, and I think your comment that is shamanic, I think really sums it up, doesn't it? Um, in terms of that. And I'm noticing uh, there's one or two questions here. And uh, Laurie McNeil asks, um, does Graham think that OBEs are an extension of consciousness from the human body? Or does he think that ultimately our consciousness is unbound and OBEs are evidence of, of that? What's your thoughts? I on don't that? know. Mm. It's one of one of the two. <laughs> yes. No, I, I guess I guess my angle on that is, yeah, that I I haven't concluded one way or the other on that one yet um i i tend to lean towards the idea that consciousness does arise from the brain 
um, but then is extended beyond the brain um, via some mechanism. That's so I'm more of the bottom up kind of mm. uh, angle on it. Whereas I know some people think that the brain is like a filter for consciousness um, or a, I, I'm not anti that possibility. That's like another, another possibility, but at the moment I'm, I guess I'm just slightly more convinced by the idea that, that it arises from the brain and um, is, is extended in some way. Okay, one of the ones that I, I'll, I'll go forward to one because I think it's a theme we could we could discuss is Paul Moran said, what does Graham think of the militarization of the OBE experience such as Project Stargate and astral projection for remote viewing? Because I know you've worked with people like Russell Targ, haven't you? And, and things in terms of the work that was done in terms of AP and remote viewing. What are, you, what are your opinions and thoughts on that? Well, I think... Um... I mean, I'm never going to be a supporter of the military or, you know, government or capitalism. <laughs> but um, but in general, I I think that the the methodology. Well, I mean, basically, it was created by more or less by Ingo Swan, so who was an artist, so he wasn't heavily sort of military military in his sort of background and whatever. But um, I think that it's a very useful protocol. It's just a way of um, applying clairvoyance essentially. And I've done experiments where I've used remote viewing and we had positive results. Um, so I think, I think that it's a, it's a positive and useful methodology. Um, it's a tool, but again, how it's used is, uh, comes down to the individuals involved and all, all of that. Um, so, it's sort of a two pronged question, I guess. What's the ethics of doing it is one level of it. And then what's the, um, how, how effective and useful is the tool? And I think the tool is uh, very useful. I'm less convinced by the ethics. I mean, I in, find in science and all of that, I think it's obviously valid as a tool to help us gain evidence for non local perception and sign. Mm. I think that's the challenge, isn't there? It's when when I'm ever, and I know with previous guests on this, that I very much of the opinion that yes, these these phenomena occur and people do experience these things, but the issue is simply one of levels of control. It's whether you can spontaneously do it, whether you can control and do it on demand. Or whether it is something, as with yourself, it's something that happens regularly, but it's something that you can facilitate, but you can't necessarily control. And I know that individuals like Ingo Swan, you know, and the claims that Ingo Swan made, you know, some were slightly extreme. And I think probably some of his remote viewing was probably by a knowledge of geography, for instance, his remote viewing of the island of Kerguelen. Um, when he said, you know, when he was starting to do these tests and he suggested it, didn't it, to Targ and his associates and said that, you know, you give me a geographical coordinate and I will go to that geographical coordinate and I'll tell you what I see. And initially that looks very impressive until you think, well, the coordinates he was given were the South Atlantic Ocean and there are only three or four islands that are habited inhabited in that area and Kerguelen being one of them and all the islands down there are going to look the same they're all going to have they're all going to be bits of rock and they're all going to have a base on it and everything else so you think well it's not that impressive because I know that my knowledge of geography would be such that if I could memorize the longitude and latitude coordinates and if somebody told me a long longitude and latitude I could visualize it on a map and of course I could then describe the environment I would find myself in if I found myself in southern Angola, for instance, you know, so it's not as convincing as that, but there are other things that he did do. But I, I, sh I should point out that the, the research you're referring to where they were using coordinates was only the early stages of grill flame, grill flame the original mm -hmm. remote viewing program. And they moved very quickly to using randomized coordinates that had no bearing right. to do with maps. Um, and all of the remote viewing for the majority of the last 
well, decades has been using randomized coordinates. Mm -hmm. So they they do not use map coordinates and no group I'm aware of okay. uses map coordinates. And, and they've had a degree of success with that as well, I, I yeah, suspect. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. even the study I was involved with with the Rhine Research Center a couple of years ago, um, I was in Estonia at the time and the experimenters were in the US. I never had any contact with the person setting the targets so i didn't directly have any communication with him um john kruf set up the whole experiment but then there were independent assessors the targets were set by someone independent of those two so the whole thing was done remotely and then i would literally just get um, a message to tell me that there was a random target that had no and I would have no information at all. There was no coordinates or anything like that because the target was a picture. So you didn't have any, you know, there was no way you could know it could be absolutely anything. Well, so, so the target would be a picture. So somebody else would be looking at the picture somewhere else, I guess. No, the, the, t the picture was just selected. There was no like outbounder that when someone right. looks at the image or goes to the location, that would be like an outbounder approach right. to, okay. to okay. remote viewing. But no, this was just literally a target was selected. It was designated as a as a target for that week, right? And that was it. And that was that was as much. All the only information I knew is that there was a target. That was it, mm. basically. And what 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 give you? Can you give me an example of what you 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 found or how it came to you? You know, did it come in a flash of inspiration? I, I tried different me methodologies um, with that project because we didn't. Do, that was over fourteen weeks, so we did a lot of experimentation and we did different approaches. So I used uh, more OBE approaches. I used Gansfeld approaches, so mild sensory deprivation. And I used um, classic remote viewing using an ideogram where you draw a little squiggle and you put the pen on it and try to pick up. So with, with an ideogram type methodology, you're just touching the pen on it. And the moment you make contact with this squiggle this ideogram that you create the moment you touch it you kind of try to get an impression is it hard is it soft is mm. it mushy is it wet you know these kinds of things um so you, you build up the picture from fragments from small elements and you build up the picture in that way so that's classic remote viewing crv sort of approach um but then um i also wanted to experiment with other methods. So all of my research has shown that sensory deprivation is helpful for out of body experiences, psi abilities, all of these kinds of areas. Um, so, and I, I talked to, about this to Dean Radin when I was at the Institute of Noetic Sciences as well. And he agreed that sensory deprivation is useful, but he said that essentially it's financial reason that this hasn't been pursued in more depth within parapsychology because most parapsycholo parapsychological organizations don't have a lot of money, um, partly because of the stigma caused by hard-nosed skepticism and you know the kind of dishonest perspectives that are pushed by those kinds of activists. So i I so so basically I tried different methodologies. Um the OBE one was effective and also the Gansfeld was effective. I would have liked to have tried deeper methods than Gansfeld, but um, again, I, I didn't have access at that point to do the experiments in that way. Um, so I used Gansfeld. Um, I used Gansfeld without sound and also with pink noise. Pink noise is like white noise, but it's slightly less intense. So it's easier on the ears and better for doing that kind of stuff so so yeah um and we got statistically significant results and some really good hits in the in the experiment basically there's a there's an interview i did with a parapsychological sort of organization online where i've posted a few examples of my drawings and the targets and things as well because that's that's very intriguing, isn't it? And of course, the people you have worked with, you know, like Dean Radin and, and Russell Targ, you know, it's um, phenomenal, you know, and this is the thing that I so admire about you is the way in which you're approaching it 
totally open minded and saying that, you know, there is a phenomenon and what is taking place. Um, and one of the, the areas I know we've discussed many times is, and I know that there will be people out there that will be interested in this, the fine line between lucid dreaming and out of the body experiences. I mean, what's your opinion on that? You know, are they the same phenomena? Are the aspects of the same phenomenon? Or is there something more interesting going on there? I think it's only a fine line if you come at things via a lucid dreaming experience or via dreaming. Um, I have waking state out of body experiences. So dreaming never really factors into it and neither does sort of sleep. You know, they're, 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 they're not... I think that's a method or, a, or an avenue that you can take. I learned to do it that way when I was sort of 16, because I'd heard you could do it that way. So I kind of was in, interested. Um, it's it's a valid approach, but there's a payoff. I, I think with, with, with everything, there's pluses and minuses to different approaches. So with lucid dreaming approaches, I think the experiences become more subjective from the data I've looked at and from my own experiences, that seems to be the case in the majority of circumstances. Um, but the lucid dreaming avenue can sometimes be easier to achieve. Whereas the waking conscious approach to induce an out of body experience um, is maybe a little harder to achieve, but you get more objectivity. So it's a kind of, you know, it depends what your, what your aims are and what your, motivation is and that kind of thing um and i tend to view i don't think there's a strong relationship um i think when you look at the actual sort of data um and you take it away from this sort of internet trend of talking about lucid dreaming all the time um and you just look across the board of people's out-of-body experiences near-death experiences um all the different contexts um you, you find that, that actually you're talking about a complete cross range of brain states. For example, the study that was done in Canada with the girl who could induce consistent out-of-body experiences, um, her brain state was not consistent with dreaming or even being in a, in a sleep or dreaming state. She was put into an fMRI scanner and the activity of her brain match with what you would expect of someone who's moving around and internet interacting with the world so also when um, um, other researchers in in the past have, have done work on that um, even people like charles tart etc um, or d scott rogo for example did work where he looked at um, whether there was consistency between a dreaming state and an out of body state again he found that there wasn't um, and then the uh, tremor study in the 1980s so before the internet and before the sort of tre trends towards lucid dreaming came about um, he found that 70 plus percent of people were having out of body experiences from a relaxed waking state then we look at the work that carlos alvarado has done as well and again we don't find um, in the general population, when you look at a, a cross range of people and you try to not bias the, the sample um, by, you know, highlighting people who are already within the OBE scene or the astral projection scene, you find, again, a mixture of states. So what I tend to think is happening is an OBE arises in many different states of consciousness and even non-states of consciousness, so i.e., a cardiac arrest um, situation, which would be a near-death experience. So I, th I think if we go down the tunnel of sort of dreaming, it can seem like that's the only window to an OBE. But when you actually sort of take a step back and you look at all the research and you look at everything that we've got, it shows more that OBEs arise from probably every state of consciousness there is. Um, including even just walking around. There's, there's cases of people driving cars and having out-of-body experiences, which doesn't sound advisable, but, you know, um, we have cases on record of that kind of thing. So if we're going to understand what an OBE is, I think we need to take a bit, like you were saying, with the, the white crow or whatever, um, we need to bring all of those elements in and say, 
okay, what's going on? I mean, even the sort of skeptical angles can get sort of sucked into this kind of trying to find one explanation and then kind of ignoring all of the others. For example, my disagreement with Sue Blackmore, um, where she was arguing that it's all to do with the temporoparietal junction and the, the TPJ, um, which is basically the part of the brain that creates the body schema, the sense of your self in space, etc. Um, she believes that that explains the out of body experience because of the work of Olaf Blanke. So that does seem to suggest there's some relationship there. But then if we look at the Canadian study that I just mentioned, the fMRI study, we find that that's not the case, that actually the TPJ was one of the areas that didn't seem to be active or didn't seem to be relevant in that particular experience. Then we find cases of synapse or fainting where people are also having out of body experiences. And in those cases, we also find differences in how the brain is reacting. Then we can look at going back to Ingo Swan, some of the work they did with him to do with out of body experiences and some of the work with Michael Persinger, for example, in Canada before he died. Um, that research again um, suggested the uh, occipital parietal junction in the brain was active. So to put it in a nutshell, there's all different areas of the brain seem to be active and all different aspects of a conscious state seem to be active and we can't sort of put it into just one sort of category, basically. I think this is coming down to the way in which neurology itself is changing, isn't it? You know, the idea of the specific areas of the brain do specific things. To a certain extent, that's true. But of course, we have the issue with the binding problem. We have the issue that there seems to be much more kind of non-locality taking place in the brain. I was talking recently to somebody about the calcium wave that seems to cross the brain at fantastic speeds. There is the glial network of the brain and the, the communication channels between the glial network themselves. So clearly there's far more here. And of course, because we don't understand the brain to the extent we would like to, we are almost su suffering here from, you know, this kind of hubris of saying that we understand what the brain is. Because as you and I both know, when we were involved in that debate at Swedenborg Hall many years ago, you know, and the idea that, you know, we 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 are the individuals that are somehow being silly and crazy because we're taking these taking people at face value when they have these experiences. And all I know is the people I know that have had these experiences are profoundly genuine individuals who have had extraordinary experiences and to just try to explain them using the materialist reductionist paradigm to the nth degree doesn't work. You know, there's there's more to it. But one of the things that um has always intrigued me is the, the the moment of leaving the body because with you they happen spontaneously you can be anywhere but you don't get the sensation of coming out of your body you're already they're not, they're not always spontaneous i mean a lot of the time they i i tend to call them um what, what I, like i described at the beginning I, I would say most of the time they're induced mm. but they're induced when I feel the conditions are right. Right. So it's so as I was mentioning that feeling of sort of heightened awareness, etc. When I feel like I'm in the right condition for the experience to happen, then I'll um, sort of activate sort of the whole process and try to induce the experience. So it's sort of a, a mixture. Um, exiting the body is depends, um, especially in my early experiences. I had more of a feeling of leaving the body because i think i had more of a i had a more grounded body schema if you like mm -hmm. i tend to think that the sense of a body is i tend to lean towards the idea that it's a construct that it's a it's a artificially internally created thing that doesn't really exist um this sense of the body that we we experience a body because we expect to experience a body, mm. we're used to experiencing a body. And the more we have the experience or the deeper we go into the conscious experience, um, the more that sense of a body tends to break down. Um, so my early experiences had a strong sense of a body. Now I tend to experience a body when I need one, <laughs> mm. when it's relevant to the experience, but the rest of the time it's not, it's not present. Um, so then again, if we go to the data, um, we find that in the sort of esoteric literature and on, on the Internet, it's all about energy bodies. 
when we look at what people actually experience, like again, referencing Carlos Alvarado's work, um, we find that the majority of people do not experience a body. It's only in the range of about 40%, depending on what research you look at. Um, the rest of the people experience either a traveling conscious awareness or a sphere, a kind of ball of awareness, something of that description. So those are the two um, types of uh, alternative that most people experience. And it's the majority, it's 60% or so. So, mm. um, but the, again, you have to go into the studies that have been done that look at large numbers of people who've had out of body experiences, ask them how they experienced, what they experienced. Um, and then you start to get more of an idea of the phenomenology of the experience rather than the, the, the just popular belief that's sort of not really based on data. I thought that your comment there was a profoundly interesting one. The idea of, the, you know, we are we are expected within the simulation to have a body, therefore we have a body, and this is what we expect. And therefore, when we start moving into altered states of consciousness, our moving away from the body is far more immediate, you know, and we have this feeling of association with the body. Whereas we get further into or down the rabbit hole or whatever we want to call it, the body link then ceases to be so important. And is this why do you think that, you know, in years gone by, and uh, Paul has asked this question about the, the silver cord, you know, the, the idea that, you know, years ago, you always had the silver cord. And if you broke the silver cord, you'd be lost forever and everything else as well. I know this is something that uh, doesn't really work in your scenario, but uh, just to go through the history of the silver cord, what are your well, thoughts even, on that? Even in the esoteric circles, a lot of, a lot of people dismiss it. I mean, going back to my teacher when I was 15 or so, Douglas Baker, um, he used to say, if you see a silver cord in your out-of-body experience, then cut it up. <laughs> um, that's what he used to say, because he said it was just a, you know, a, like a crutch kind of thing. Um, the silver cord, well, people do experience it, but it's a very small percentage of the time. Um, it's definitely not a consistent thing in the majority of people to work out whether it's some kind of cultural thing that, it, that people have heard about it and sort of expect it. And, and that's kind of where the root of it is. I don't know. Um, but in my own research, I think, I think I found something like with the people I work with, it was something like 0.5 zero to 0 0.5 percent of people um carlos alvaredo's research found about zero um and some of the other research in the past like uh, celia green um for example she found i think she got to something around eight or nine percent something like that but it's never been a big feature i think the biggest instance of it um was in a brazilian study i believe or yeah i think it was brazilian um and they found around 30 percent of people but that still means 70 percent of people weren't having mm. it so if you sort of average it you're you're talking something like across all the studies that have been done it's something in the region of sort of 10 percent. and i think in the most if, if you look at the most recent studies it's, it seems to have gone down significantly since the sort of 60s and 70s. Mm. So, so it's almost so, yeah. anticipation, isn't it? It's almost a, a social construct as much as anything. But if reality in itself is a social construct, that's not at all surprising, is it? Um, Shelley has asked an interesting question as well. Um, I have had disassociative experiences in life-threatening circumstances. I had a pleasant one, which I thought was an astral projection encounter. Are they one and the same? I'm sorry to hear about the negative experiences. Um, I don't think disassociative experiences are one and the same. No, I think that um, uh, they have clear um, signposts, if you like, uh, of distress and, and uh, things to do with psychosis, etc., which are not relatable to a standard out-of-body experience, which happen in the general population you know, and, and happen in sort of healthy individuals. So um, if I'm getting the 
what she means by dissociative correctly um, in terms of the sort of psychiatric definition of it, then yeah, I think there's a clear and distinct difference between the two things. And even in terms of the characteristics of how the experience happens and you know it's it's more of an, a, an alienation to the physical body often in those kinds of experiences which is quite distinct from an out-of-body experience where there's not like a rejection of the body or an alienation to the body or a, anything like that so that would be my understanding mm. but I'm not a psych psychiatrist so yeah because I mean I'd, I'd add in the you know sort of phenomenal like autoscopy and hoitoscopy yeah. whereby you know doppelganger syndrome these kind of things whereby the you know your body is seen in front of you you possibly transparent or whatever whereas you know and again when we had the debate with uh, with the lady from the uh, Blanquet group you know this is the argument they're doing isn't it that they can create a kind of a body image you know Jane by Aspel, I think was the name yes Aspinall that's right and Aspel. the I Aspel was it yes okay yeah. and um you know the idea that you can create a kind of disassociative of your body image and therefore you you kind of transpose yourself into the projection in front of you using virtual reality and things but that's reproducing it's not reproducing the same sensation in, in any way at all I would imagine from anybody no. that's had these experiences you know it's it's just saying because something's like something it doesn't mean it's explained it you know which is um it, it, it's not even like it I mean again you know the out-of-body experience is is so multifaceted and mm. has so many aspects to it um the problem with that research is it heavily relies on this concept of being out of the body and looking back at the body mm. um you you find this sort of sneakiness almost in a lot of skeptical research where they emphasize the being out of body looking back at the body well, the majority of my experiences, I'm not looking back at the body. I rarely see my body. Um, so instantly that kind of becomes irrelevant. And, and so then you realize that that explanation is not really explaining anything. Um, and by pretending that you're having an out body experience, I don't really see how that can then be called the same thing. I mean, I've worked with virtual reality myself. I did a large-scale installation at the Science Museum in the early 2000s and we used multi-sensory stereoscopic vision three-dimensional worlds created in in the computer and projected on a 10 meter curving screen um, so we worked with all of that kind of stuff in that project and I think went much deeper in terms of like the experience of being out of body um, because instead of it just being out of body looking back at yourself you literally felt like you were in a different environment and able to move around and interact with the environment um, on a on a bigger scale and you you had full immersion you didn't have to wear a headset either because you, you just you just had glasses like lightweight mm. glasses because um, the screen acted as the, the visual field because it was a huge screen um, so when you when you kind of take a project like that and compare it to what they were doing it was kind of like well that takes you much closer to an out of body experience but at the same time it's still not an out of body experience my whole intention behind that kind of work like my installation work that i did um, back at that time was aimed at creating a sensation or the sensation similar to an out of body experience in order to help people induce the real thing um, because they would start to get into this sort of mindset it would be a similar feeling a similar set of emotions and a similar set of sensations so then that would lead them easier to a full out body experience so the you know that whole project was based on the fact that 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 is not an out body experience mm. and it um and it's functioning in a completely different way so it, it was really just a a very hyper modern technique really a way mm. of inducing them 
One of the questions that's come through is Linda, and it's something I, I was going to be asking as well, was about the vibrational state. It, it, what research has there been, if there has been any research on the vibration state as to what is taking place there? What, you know, it is, it's quite intriguing, isn't it, why it's associated with vibration? And I know from previous interviews we've done on here and ones we'll be doing in the future, you know, the link between the vibrational state and the DMT experience and the ayahuasca experience as well. There seems to be similarities here. And I was just wondering what the neurological research or what your opinion is on what may be taking place as to why we have that sensation. We don't have really any solid neurological research um, that I'm aware of um, that goes into the vibrational state specifically. Um, when I was writing my second book, I did a lot of research where I spoke to many many different people and got detailed descriptions of the vibrational state and i what what i concluded was that there's a there's a real continuum of elements to it it's not um it's not just that you can define it in a very clear cut way but there are a few consistencies that we can identify across most people's vibrational state if not everyone's vibrational state um, it usually is something akin to electrical in nature usually people descri describe something like a current or a feeling of electricity so that's the first definer um, and the second one is um, the actual sense of sort of shaking or movement or vibration or that kind so those are the two sort of elements but but the vibration part can be more or less. It doesn't necessarily follow that it's very, very pronounced. For example, um, someone can have a strong sense of electrical current running through them, but they might not have any real vibration. It might be very, very mild, almost more like an undulation rather than a really defined vibration. Whereas other people have described things like freight trains, planes taking off. So very, very intense vibrations. So the next thing I did with my research was, okay, so if people are having this range of intensities of the vibration, are there any sort of importance to the differences? Like if, if it's very intense, the assumption might be, does that mean it's going to, uh, be a more powerful out-of-body experience um, in actual fact the opposite seems to be the case wow um, that's so interesting that's amazing <laughs> um, yeah so so what what I found was the milder vibrations tend to suggest that maybe going back to what I was saying about shifting out of body and how you might have that assumption of you know that you're a body an energy body and that you're sort of coming out of yourself and all that kind of thing but what seems to be the case is if you have a strong um, identification with your body, then the vibrations will tend to be more intense. Um, they tend to sort of, if you think about it like a muscle that you're not very used to working out, so it might be kind of more stiff and more painful and more intense. And as time goes on, doing the same movement, say in yoga or something, might become much more fluid and much more smooth and you don't have the sort of you know intensity and awkwardness anymore um i think it might be something akin to that but again like i said we need proper research across a big amount of people this is based on what i've managed to find looking at my own students etc do you think this relates then to this idea of you accessing a higher vibrational state and the closer you are to that higher vibrational state the easier your transition is between uh, where you currently are like you say the people that are very much rooted in the physical body and the material realm um, have more of a jerky uh, denser vibratory experience than people that are perhaps closer to that already. Um, I don't really look at it like that to be honest I tend to think the physical plane might be the ultimate plane and like the the outcome of everything else like you know mm. the the ultimate expression of it all um so 
I don't I don't think there's a hierarchy in in spirituality. No, I don't, I don't mean necessarily that it's higher, like maybe finer in some way, like you say, a kind of what what some people would call the astral realm, because it does seem like, you know, you were saying that you're able to access these other um, time periods. And so the, there is a very strong suggestion there that some in this in this vibrational state were able to access things beyond the material realm that they're not necessarily more important or better than the material realm but they exist in um, a different frequency somehow perhaps I I, th I just think we don't know you don't know where they exist I guess um, it could be a frequency but it could easily be something else um, so so I guess that's sort of an open question for me I, I don't know if it's a if it's a frequency um, specifically but with the vibrations what I was going to say is not everyone has the vibrations either um, the vibrations are uh, the most common um, seems about 60 70 percent something like that of people but there are other transitional stages some people hear noises like even music um, some people hear buzzing and things like that then we have um, the void state, which is another transitional stage, um, which I've been discovering more and more with my work. So that seems to be where people go into a, it's almost like a rudimentary level of consciousness, a, a form of consciousness that only functions on the most basic level. So you're self-aware, but there's no visual information. There's no, no complex thinking, nothing like that. And then from that, the outer body experience starts to arise um, out of that. So that that's another transitional state or stage as well. So it's interesting. We just had an interesting message from our good friend, Myron Dial uh, over in California. And Myron says, I feel vibrations just before the pull, as I call it, that takes me out of my body. I feel it coming from the middle of my body and then I'm out but it is my body that goes out for I use my hands connections in the other dimensions that I'm traveling to. Now, Myron again experiences temporal lobe epilepsy uh, and is a quite famous temporal lobe epileptic artist, um, which brings us to the links between um, neurological states such as TLE and everything to this as well. And indeed, probably the near death experience. Um, so maybe we could discuss a little bit about that as well. What was the question specifically? What uh, the, the links between um, temporal lobe epilepsy and the temporal lobe experience and near-death experiences and indeed the outer body experience. Um, again, it's it's a tricky one because we haven't got we haven't got sort of solid data on on links between well definitely with the outer body experience. So I guess it comes back to what we were talking about in terms of the brain areas that are active um and it it hasn't seemed to be isolated or focused on temp the temporal lobes um so but but there does seem to be in some of the research unusual unusual electrical activity in the areas of the brain that are active so anomalous activity so we don't know what that activity represents um, I tend to think that's probably something to do with the psi aspects. Going back to Ingo Swan and Michael Persinger, for example, when Ingo Swan was accurate in his remote viewing perceptions and his brain was being monitored at the time, um, it was clear that there were these unusual electrical activities, but they only correlated with when he was accurate. So this was almost Michael Persinger, one of his major intentions while he was alive was to make technology that could enhance psi. He believed that psi functioned within the electromagnetic field of the earth. That was his personal theory on how it worked. And he felt that we could enhance it using the Koran helmet or the God helmet. Um, and so using particular configurations, one of which he called the octopus configuration, which was the configuration that seemed to enhance psi. So with that particular configuration, it seemed to sort of 
make it more likely that you could have psi experiences or possibly out of body experiences and things like that. Um, and he did put some emphasis on the temporal lobes. So, but again, like I said, I think the evidence tends to, to suggest that it's sort of broader. It's like the whole brain is active or different parts of the brain, depending on the type of experience, et cetera. But um, temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, you've done a lot more research on that. So mm. I think that's sort of more your thoughts on that would be more relevant. Have you, have you done any research into anesthesia? Because I wonder about um, potential out of body experiences during general anesthetic or if that's ever been researched. Well, that's that's an interesting one as well, because with anesthesia, they don't really know what the mechanism is mm. that turns off your consciousness. That's that's as far as my understanding, that's that's the kind of really fascinating thing about it, that they they give you these drugs and you kind of you go out, but they don't really know what the part is that causes you to go out, um, which I think is kind of fascinating. Um, but I guess this comes back to the whole problem of we don't know what consciousness is. Mm. We've kind of got the hard problem of consciousness. So when we're talking about what makes you unconscious or what makes you sort of super conscious or extended conscious or whatever, we don't we don't even know what our, what the default is to go yeah. to, to sort of get into these other areas. I think what you've done is you've hit the nail on the head here, haven't you? In the the idea that uh, the present paradigm when it comes to the hard problem of consciousness, as uh, David Chalmers called it, you know, we, we really don't understand, you know, and for instance, we know the work of Stuart Hammerhoff and the whole reason that Stuart Hammerhoff and his ORC OR ideas with Roger Penrose was because Hammerhoff as a consultant and anesthesiologist at the University of New Mexico or Arizona, it's Arizona, isn't it? I think he was completely intrigued as to, to why anesthesia works why does a general anesthetic do what it yeah. does and they don't know do they you know there's this yeah. idea we know we know what it does but we've no idea how it's again this kind of magical science that is a pretense almost because of course we have to believe that our doctors know what they're doing they know what it can do but they don't know why it can do it you know and you we come across i know graham and i we've just you know we've discussed this many times you know there's this whole feeling of frustration dealing with 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 closed-minded scientists and skeptics because they just believe they have all the answers and of course they don't you know and I think probably coming towards the end of the discussion now it's probably an interesting area to move into you know the professional skeptics that we have to deal with and the the issues they they bring about i mean what are your opinions i know what your opinions are but i'm sure the guys <laughs> out there would love to know what your opinions are on the 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 the, the super skeptics or the pseudo skeptics or whatever we want to call them and the problems they cause and the kind of research we're trying to do i like the pseudo skeptic because marcello chuzzi who basically coins the extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence um although his version was a little bit less concise, but he basically also coined the term pseudo-skeptic because he said that if a skeptic makes the claim that, that you know, there's some artifact or some anomalous thing that's taking place that, that allows for these experiences, then they're also making a claim. And so the burden of proof is also on them to, to sort of identify what that is. Um, I think there's a there's a a value to sort of genuine skepticism, but I think, and I what I, what I would say is um, I like the I like the idea of uh, Popper's idea of this this thing of um, challenging your own beliefs and challenging looking for ways to explain or to unravel your own constructs and your own belief systems um, as being fundamental to a sort of scientific understanding. Um, I would go further and to see that almost as really important to any kind of positive or ethical or um, useful kind of way of looking at the world. If we, I think what, what we tend to do is look for things that will sort of confirm the, the confirmation bias thing where we look for things that 
will support what we already think. And I, and I think as you do with your research, when you're looking into the things that, you know, that are outside of the standard understandings, the things that challenge or contradict the ordinary ways of looking at things, um, we have to look at those because they're the things that essentially undermine this framework that we've built up, this sort of belief system. We want to, I think, at least in my life, I, I, I want to try and strip away belief systems as much as possible. If I go back to my early experiences, they held me back. A lot of those early experiences were illusory. And I think part of that was because of my belief systems, because I believed that there was going to be an energy body and there was going to be a this and a that. And because I believed that, I would often encounter some form of that. And it was only with time that I started to understand that if you strip those things down, you start to perceive reality more as it really is, or, or it seems to be become more consistent to how reality seems to be. Um, so, of course, if something is true, if one of those esoteric beliefs is true and you challenge it with everything you've got and it still holds up, then you've only made it stronger. You've mm -hmm. only kind of confirmed how important it is and how relevant it is. And I think with all of the things that I've challenged and all of the ways that I've framed things at it to try and break down a lot of my belief systems, a lot of the core ideas that consciousness can extend beyond the body that we can experience things out of body or at a location away from where we're physically located that psi is real all of these kinds of things have been confirmed by doing that um, if there was a solid skeptical sort of angle to explain all of those things i would probably i would probably go with it mm -hmm. um, sue blackmore said to me when we had a debate going back to the sort of skeptics when we debated, she said to me, I can't remember whether it was on, on air or off air, but she said, like, I would love it to be true. You know, I'd love all this to be true. And I said to her, I wouldn't love it to be true. You know, I have no investment in it being true. In actual fact, by it being true, in my opinion, from my experience and my research, by it being true, all it means is I have to be, I have to put myself and I have to be into the category of being uncredible and being dismissed by the majority of the mainstream of science and society. I have to ostracize myself by saying, I think that there's some validity to this. It would be a lot easier for me to talk about, you know, the research of Olaf Blanke, or I, I could do the skeptics job. I could talk about all of these researchers and how the science demonstrates this and that. Um, it would be much easier to do that and then you're no longer ridiculed you become part of the in club you know and all the rest of it but we know through the history of science and the history of human thought that that's not the way to go that in general things have never been the mainstream view and i think it's still the same way is mainstream music the best music out there? Is mainstream literature the best literature out there? Is mainstream politics the best politics out there? You know, is mainstream technology the best technology out there? I mean, it's when you think about all those things, the answer to all of them is no. Um, and I don't think that's even particularly controversial. You know, so believing that the mainstream is some kind of arbiter of truth, which is mm. the sort of skeptical position, you get into a very dangerous area because then a lot of the skeptics have to then support mainstream political views as well. Um, you know, and so they, they, they end up in this almost self-imposed censorship that they start to have to toe the, the party line or toe the mainstream viewpoint with things, because if they come out and say, Oh, I think there might be something to, telepathy research for example this happened with sam harris sam harris looked at the psi research and he said i think there might be something to this and then the skeptical community came down on him like a ton of bricks for saying that he even had a phone conversation with rupert sheldrake about it um, rupert told me that um so you know so sam harris had a little bit of open-mindedness to to the possibility and it caused this huge backlash 
So while I think skepticism has a value, I think the skeptical activist movement, as I call them, they're not, I wouldn't say they're really, they're not scientists because the vast majority of them are not doing science. Mm. They're critics. They're people who are doing activism to put a particular opinion across. It's, it's, it's a form of propaganda. And I mean, that's, that is genuinely what it is because they're pushing a particular worldview um, and using various media to do that. Um, it's not based on the science because we have this body of parapsychology that supports the idea that Psy exists. So it is more like someone who's criticizing evolution or, or climate science or something like that. It's more like someone who's looking at the science and saying, no, I don't agree with the science. That's more what the skeptical, they position themselves as being on the side of science, but actually they're denying a huge field of science because they, or a, a particular area of science because they don't agree with it. Um, but that's not the same thing as being a scientist, you know? Like, like I, I think it's important to be critical of research and to analyze research and to dig into research, but to actually not be willing to change your mind or to have different understandings come to the fore, that's not science in my view. I was going to come in with another question there, but I feel that that was such an incredible, incredible five minute speech. I don't think anybody should follow that and it should be allowed to stand as being a incredible statement of um, analysis and intent. And all I can say is, Graham, that was simply sensational. I wish I'd said Thank it, you. but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm aware now that we're getting towards the end of our two hours, and it's always the case that we never have enough time here. And I know that we've had some fantastic questions from the the um, the uh, the room as well, which is really really good. And I'm sure that there will be lots of people here that will be really fascinated because, as somebody has said here, and I cannot but disagree is that Graham exudes authenticity. I appreciate his mind. That was Lehman Dollins. And I think that oh, defines you. everything. And I think your authenticity is something I've always admired in you, that you, 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 you just say it as it is and your honesty just comes through. You know, you are, you are a you. real person that is seeking truth. And I think that is incredibly important. So in which case, in terms of that, how can people contact you and tell us a little bit about your courses that you do and everything else as well that would be really good um they can contact me through my website there's a they can just go to the contact form contact me there or my, my email address is just info at grahamnichols.ch because it's in swiss switzerland for privacy reasons um so uh yeah my website grahamnichols.com um there's all the contact info on there. I have a video course that people can um, just uh, sign up for, download, um, has many hours of lectures on the theoretical side, the practical side, the techniques, the foundational pre-state that I mentioned earlier, all of that kind of stuff is covered and how to develop it and work with it. Um, and there's also an option to have an hour uh, personal coaching with me as well um, as a package. So the course and that. Um, my book, my second book, Navigating the Outer Body Experience is also included in that. So you get the book as well. And I also do the private tuition as well. So if people are interested in that, they can just contact me and I can, I'll tell you all about it. So yeah, that's basically what I do. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Graham. That was exceptionally interesting. Um, and so many areas, as people are saying, you know, as Laura Stuckey has said, absolutely wonderful interview. I'll be thinking about this for days, if not years. And I think that that really kind of sums it up as well. So everybody, thank you again for listening in. Um, as per usual, this will, is, has been recorded and will go up to my um, uh, my YouTube channel later on today. And we have two interviews this week because on Wednesday at 10 o'clock, um, I'll be linking in over to Japan 
um, to be discussing um, similar topics with uh, Dr. Andrew Gallimore, who is a neuropharmacologist, and we'll be discussing again altered states of consciousness with specific ideas about the DMT realm and everything else as well. So thanks very much for listening in. And um, as always, um, thank you again for Sarah in the background for making this happen, because without her, I wouldn't be able to do it. So thank you very much, everybody, and we'll speak to you soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.